So when you hear the words that we're all one, bet on it. Everything that you're doing to someone else, you're going to experience it. Because that's the nature of divine reality. Yeah. And at the end of it, it's just this question. And this is a Danianism. If God couldn't come today and God sent you. In the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? That's the meaning of life. Yeah. Exploring the Human Journey My name is David Marsh. In 2015, I was angry at the religious beliefs I'd grown up with all my life that some people go to heaven and most people go to hell when they die because they didn't accept Jesus in their heart. I asked God why he put a system in place where people would burn in conscious eternal torment. It just didn't make sense. And I was dissatisfied with any answers that my tradition had for me. Then an idea popped in my head that I should do a Google search. What happens when we die? I learned about a thing called a near-death experience and that millions of people had died, had an experience with God or universe or spirit or consciousness or whatever you want to call it. And there was no judgment and there was no division of heaven or hell. And then they came back to talk about it. One of the most powerful stories that I read was from a man called Daniel Brinkley. His story changed my perception about God and what we are all doing here. In 1975, Daniel Brinkley was talking on the phone during a thunderstorm. A bolt of lightning hit the phone line, sending thousands of volts of electricity into his head and down his body. His heart stopped and he died, but in the process he had a near-death experience. When Brinkley revived in the morgue after 28 minutes of death, he had an incredible story to tell. He talks about it in his book, Saved by the Light. Here is a little bit about his story from his perspective. Below me was my own body thrown across the bed. My shoes were smoking and the telephone was melted in my hand. I could see Sandy run into the room. She stood over the bed and looked at me with a dazed expression. Tommy showed up in less than 10 minutes and he knew something was wrong because he had heard the explosion on the telephone. I watched as Tommy held me and cursed the slowness of the ambulance, which we could hear approaching in the distance. I hovered above the three of them, Sandy, Tommy, and myself, as the medical technicians loaded me onto the stretcher and wheeled me into the ambulance. Then I looked up and there was a tunnel, and the tunnel came to me. There was the sound of chimes as the tunnel spiraled toward me and then around me. Soon there was nothing to be seen, no crying, Sandy, no ambulance attendants trying to jumpstart my dead body, no desperate chatter with the hospital over the radio, only a tunnel that engulfed me completely and the intensely beautiful sound of seven chimes ringing in rhythmic succession. I looked ahead into the darkness and there was a light up there and I began to move toward it as quickly as possible and I could see a silver form appearing like a silhouette through the mist. As it approached, I began to feel a deep sense of love that encompassed all of the meanings of the word. As the being of light came closer, these feelings of love intensified until they became all too pleasurable to withstand. Looking at this being, I had the feeling that no one could love me better. No one could have more empathy, sympathy, encouragement, and non-judgmental compassion for me than this being. I had gained the knowledge that I could use to correct my life. I could hear the being's message in my head as if through telepathy. Humans are powerful spiritual beings meant to create good on earth. This good isn't usually accomplished in bold actions, but in single acts of kindness between people. It's the little things that count, because they are more spontaneous and show who you truly are. I was elated. I now knew the simple secret to improving humanity. The amount of love and good feelings that you have in the end of your life is equal to the love and the good feelings you put out during your life. It was just that simple. Daniel Brinkley was eventually revived and lived to tell about his experience. Since then, he has had three other near-death experiences, and he has a unique perspective on life and death. I was so thrilled to be able to talk with him personally.
Hi and welcome. I'm glad that you joined us today. I am out of my mind excited. We have Daniel Brinkley on set today. To me, it's such an honor to be here and have you having a conversation with us. One of the most important things in my life, a defining moment, was your near-death experience, your story. Uh, I was a Christian guy, angry at the world or angry at God for this heaven-hell thing, and as I deconstructed, I got on Google and typed, what happens when we die? And one of the near-death experiences that came up was yours, and I went, ah. Oh. Maybe when we die, we're not dead. Maybe when we die, there's not heaven and hell judgment. Maybe we're all connected and everything that you brought and taught through your experience contributed to my life. So thank you for your experience and sharing it with the world. It's helped millions of people and I'm just one little guy in well, that. You know, David, when you, when you stop and you look at it, when, in 1975, I grew up a bad guy. You know, I grew up a tough guy. Like I said earlier, I just hit it in the face and see what it did. You hit it in the face and see what happens. Yeah, right? you know, okay, because it talks cheap. I used to have a saying, well, screw you. What are you going to do about it? What are you waiting on? Yeah. Christ's sake, if we got the talking part done, and then I would knock them out. Yeah, Marine, right? You know, and then it was done. Yeah. Sports, football, all that. And then <laughs> one day being struck by lightning, in the course of being struck by lightning, I discovered a whole new reality about who we are. Mm -hmm. Okay, and... In discovering that reality, you either adhere to it or you don't. You know, you adhere to it or you don't. And what I realized is that all the stuff I'd ever been told didn't make any sense. It's all crazy stuff. Yeah. I can go back to uh, when I was like 14 years old or 15 years old. Um, we had a new girl coming to this biology class. So I moved from my seat to sit behind her to talk to her. Yeah. Because, oh, we know how that goes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that was basically my entire interest. Uh huh. You know, once I discovered women, I sought to know everything about the discovery of women. <laughs> Tell me more. You know, who was, you know, I went from National Geographic to Playboy, so I was big time. Oh, yeah. So I, the teacher came in and grabbed me by my right ear. Oh, boy. But I'm left handed. And before I realized it was a teacher, I had knocked them cold. So I had to go to the RAs, the Royal Ambassadors Weekend for Wayward Boys. Oh, boy. So they were telling me I was, uh, I was guilty of something some people were doing in the desert 6,000 years ago. It wasn't that I knocked out the biology teacher. It was that uh, some girl... Someplace in the desert 6,000 years ago, she not only saw a snake, she started talking to the snake. And I thought to myself, now how many women you know sees a snake going to stand around and talk to it? Yeah. And what that snake wanted her to do was get her boyfriend to eat an apple so he would realize he was naked. Yeah. Well, I kind of went along with some parts of that because I'd probably, if I'd have been a snake, I might have been thinking the same thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> but what I realized is how can I be guilty of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much of that at 14 years old from South Carolina you think I'm going to believe? Yeah. I mean, think about it. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. All I did was hit the teacher. And it was assault, so he couldn't do anything to me because he grabbed me. That's technically assault. And uh. I was defending myself in South Carolina. <laughs> yes. so, you know, it wouldn't matter if I'd have kicked him a couple of times. But uh, nonetheless. You started and, your legal career at 14. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, I been through a few of those situations before. I mean, I was a fighter. I, yeah. I paid attention to being a bully, and I paid attention that I could knock you out. Mm. And I paid attention to the art form of knocking you out. And if I played sports, it was to hit you as hard as I can in the most damaging place. Mm -hmm. And that's all I thought about until yeah. you discovered your spiritual being. But here comes the best one. I'm sitting around, and I'm trying to figure out this funeral business. And I'm still just 14 years old. I'm trying to figure out this funeral business, okay? So if you're going to die and you're going to go to hell, because I've been telling everybody, has been telling me I was going to go to hell, you know. So I'm trying to figure out this funeral business. So when you go to a funeral, everybody's telling you that, you know, Aunt Grandmama's with Uncle Ben and Aunt Sadie, and they're up in heaven floating in some clouds listening to some heart music. <laughs> yeah. Doing whatever they're doing. Yeah. I said, wait a minute. Christianity says this nobody's going to heaven mm. till Jesus comes back with an army of angels 
to throw some guy, Lucifer, Satan, the bad guy, the yeah. devil, yeah. Beelzebub, yeah. Lord of the Flies. It sounded to me like he'd been in the witness protection yep. program. Change his name. And, he's gonna, <laughs> and it's going to have to throw him in some lake of fire. Uh -huh. Where in the hell is a lake of fire? Yeah, in hell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And no, no. No, this is, no, it's not hell. Because oh, right. if you're going to throw the devil in a lake of fire, you'd throw him in where he came from. Yeah. So that's all crazy. Yeah. So I, I, I'm listening to that. So anybody who thinks being a Christian that they're going to go to heaven before Jesus comes back means that they're not paying attention to the stuff they're preaching. Mm -hmm. They're going to yeah. lie in that box filled with formaldehyde till Jesus comes back. So at 14, knowing that and listening to them tell me this, I like Jesus because anybody can turn water into wine is already a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I liked about Jesus, anybody can take three fishes and five loaves of bread and feed the multitude and could turn water into wine. I wanted to have a catering business with him when he gets yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's the business mind. Oh, yeah. Okay. And the fact that it's 2,000 years and we're killing each other mm -hmm. and we're starving each other. Yeah. And you look at that, there's no way that could be true. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I'm struck by lightning. And I realize that all that stuff is not true. You can't believe it. Mm. It's not true. Yeah. Somebody made it up. And if you look in Christianity, I'm not sure about the character of Jesus because there's so many characters like that throughout yeah. Mithra, which yes. yeah. when you look at Paul and Peter in the schism at the Antioch church, one by one by grace, the other by deeds. When it's Mithra and all Roman centurions were the peacock angel and Born on the twenty, born on the twenty fifth. Yep. Dies on the on death Easter. and resurrection. Yeah. The same. That's like ten or twelve of those. Yep. Okay, so what we have to look at is this. I discovered that nobody dies. You don't die. Yep. And if I didn't go to hell, nobody's going. Yep. If anybody deserved to go to hell, it was me. Mm -hmm. So here comes in my life a realization that you don't die and you don't go to hell. That was 1975. I was dead, struck by lightning, dead for 28 minutes, complete, completely paralyzed for six days, partially paralyzed for seven months, two years to learn to walk and feed myself. Had a lot of time to think and uh, had a lot of time to really look at what was real and was it not real. But the thing that was the most important real thing that's over there that you can bring here today is the panoramic life review. My mm. I have studied the panoramic life review more than any other event in the near-death experience because that's something that's from over there that is applicable over here. Mm -hmm. You will see you're into your lift out of your body. You'll let that breath out and you'll lift out of your body. And because you resonate, it's not vibrate, but because you resonate, you're waves of energy now. You're continuously waves of energy. And you look down and you disassociate from what you just left. You just look at it, you know, it's like turn it off bonanza. Yeah. Okay, you, you're looking at it, but you're no longer attached to it. Yeah. You know, it's just something you're looking at. And you've had that yeah. where you're standing out looking at your body. Floating then. above it, standing next to it. I've been through four near-death experiences. Struck by lightning, open heart surgery, brain surgery, open heart surgery. Mm hmm Okay. And and you did die during all those surgeries. Well, I've been dead three times, been clinically dead three times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, four near-death experiences. Okay. Because the first time when I was dead, I had a near-death experience. Open-heart surgery, I had a near-death experience. Brain surgery, I had a near-death experience. Open-heart surgery, I had a near-death experience. So in September of 1975, I was dead. On October... The 19th, 2018, on a Sunday morning at 2 a.m., I went after open heart surgery. I went into cardiac arrest. Mm. Okay. And they had to resuscitate me, breaking ribs. And then they kept me for eight or nine minutes, and I went back into cardiac arrest. Whew. So I'm dead. So I've been dead three times. Yeah. But in the course of it, because you're on a respirator, you know, I'm on a machine keeping me alive. Right then I don't call that a death experience. That's a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. Okay? When I was being resuscitated, I didn't go anywhere. 
I came out of my body and I was standing next to the nurse, standing up next to the nurse, looking at him, breaking my ribs. And then when they resuscitated me, being calm and coming back into my body, and then I flatlined again in the same procedure, except they put the pedals on me and threw the electricity to me, and I definitely came back. <laughs> mm. Wow. Did you have a sensation of coming back into the body? Well, the whole point of it is you leave really fast. Yeah. But when you're outside of your body watching it, you're no longer dimensionally participating. Oh. You're an observer. And if you wanted to focus on something, you could focus on it. You could focus on it because what I focused on is the brilliance of the nursing staff. I'm dead, but you know I'm so used to this this stuff after going through these six experiences. Yeah. I'm used to it by now. And on top of that, and I'll get back to that point about the panoramic life review. On top of that, I've been a hospice volunteer for 40 years. Mm. And I've been a hospice volunteer in the VA for 31 years. And I've accrued 33,000 hours at the bedside. Wow. And I've been with 2,010 people going from this world to the next and 346 taking their last breath. And I'm the co-founder of the Twilight Brigade, the largest end-of-life care volunteer program for dying veterans in American history. Wow. So all that was cunning more than it was being a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your research? Yeah. Well, you know, if you kill me four or five times, you got my attention. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get the deal in what you do about it. So yeah. when you come to a conclusion that you are a spiritual being and that you are chosen to come here. Oh, I love that. And you choose to come here. Yeah. Okay. The divine architect believes there's no one more important than you to be born in the social psychological place that you're born in, bringing in with the deal that you cut to be here because you see opportunity to do, to learn, teach, or support something. Mm -hmm. That's how you get here. Yeah. And when you get here, you very rarely ever fail what you're sent here to do, but you can create variable opportunities in the course of what you chose yeah. to do because a lot of times people get it done. Then there's an accident and they leave accident. Yeah. None of that stuff is works. Nothing works like that. Mm -hmm. You have probable possibilities of events based on every action and every breath you take. Yeah. I know this gets yeah. cosmic, but well, it's beautiful because no, you give it, order. You you said there's absolute order in this process. Yes. Yeah. What what I've been through it so many times, and I've been with so many people as they left this world. I see the order, and like I said earlier in the talk, I said when you get to looking at quantum mechanics and sub 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 subatomic sub, sub particles a neutrino like an eight times subatomic particle and you see it's organized and orderly what makes you think chaos as a theory is anything but a viable theory and the potential for everything that's going on around you you are co-creating it yeah. and there's no escape from that yeah you are responsible, but let's get back to the point of once you lift out of your body and you disassociate from those things, you feel relief. Mm. I was burning and on fire the first time. Oh, boy. Right. I was paralyzed and I couldn't see because the flash of the light of the ball of fire that came through the room burnt my eyes. I wore welder's glasses and I couldn't see. But when I lifted out of my body, I didn't hurt. I wasn't in pain. I could move and I could see. Mm. So... Wherever I was, which was dead, mm -hmm. was a whole lot better than where I had just left. <laughs> <Right. laughs> you know, okay, yeah. well, you know, you can keep all of that. I'm done with it. Yeah. Let me tell you something cool that I noticed. Everything has an energy field. There was a, in the 70s, they, the big craze was a rubber plant. It was like a tie plant. Mm -hmm. You stick a little root in the ground and you water it. And I never did like it because it was always in the way when I came down the hall. But <laughs> it sat next to the sliding glass doors that went out a little patio for the bedroom. And I could tell that that plant was worried about me. Oh, boy. Uh, when I'm floating above it, this plant was worried about me. Mm. And it was caring about what I was going through, both in the physical form, but also in this ethereal level. Mm. I come to find out later that the secret life of plants, that the guy who invented the lie detector had tested it on a plant, 
and that he had connected electrodes to a plant and put a cigarette lighter, and the plant reacted to the heat of the cigarette lighter. He went outside, closed the door, and lit the cigarette lighter outside, thinking of burning in the plant, and the plant reacted to it. Wow. That's the basis of the proof that brought the lie detector into existence. Yeah. So that was a reinforcement to me that what I was experiencing was really what I was experiencing. Yeah. So you'll come to a place where you go down a tunnel, you come to a place of bright, brilliant, you beautiful light. People say they make Jesus or they talk to God. Exactly. That don't yeah. never happen. Yep. Yeah. That's all. I mean, whatever that belief system is, you go into it. Whatever you need to be uh, able to interpret what just happened some to you becomes necessary. Yeah. yeah. Nothing you hear anybody say is exactly yeah. how it happens. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And now you have to look at this factor too, guys. Probably about twenty-five percent of everyone you hear is really not true. Ooh. Oh. Because watch. Because of Raymond Moody and myself in the early years, most people never realize it. The hospital they took me to in the near-death experience was the hospital where Raymond Moody was going to medical school, the oh, guy who wow. wrote Life oh. After Life. Yeah, Life After Life was the so big one. So yeah, I was one. with Raymond 20 years. Yeah. I, I'll take pride in that I helped drive the near-death experience into mainstream consciousness. Yes. I was oh, not absolutely. an academic. I was somebody that happened to. And there was a place and point in time when I went on about my life and I kept it to myself and I would help Raymond in what he was doing. Okay, but when I would talk to people and have this experience, they said they told their minister and the minister said that's something you need to talk told the doctor and the doctor said that's something you need to talk to your minister about. Told the minister and the minister said that's something you need to talk to your doctor about. And people were frightened and they had stories that you have to tell somebody. I had Raymond. Mm. Okay, and he asked the right questions because yeah. I didn't tell people crap. So I figured that if people were going to attack them and they had an experience, somebody needed to defend them. Mm. So I decided you need to pick on somebody on size. And if you think you're going to say it's oxygen, de brain deprivation, temporal lobe seizures, epileptic shock, all those things. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to bring that crap over here to me. Oh, because oh. you're a fighter and you're ready you know, to defend it. I already had it happen to me, and you're funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, you're funny, so shut up. Oh. And so somebody had to defend, so I wrote Saved by the Light mm -hmm. 18 years, and that was me picking a fight. Yeah. This happens. It happened to me. I might not have believed it if it hadn't happened to me, but it happened to me. And by the time I wrote uh, saved, I'd already been through my second one of these. Yeah, wow. Okay, that was open heart surgery. Yeah. My biggest crisis, guys, is hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I cannot, based on the value system that I measure everything in, I trap myself in hypocrisy. I cannot stand to see what happens to people in palliative and end of life. Mm -hmm. I cannot see people starving and I cannot see baby abuse and rape and pedophilia. I cannot stand it because it breaks every spiritual law that is within consciousness to grow. Mm. And it retards both your growth and mm. the growth of those people interacting with you, which goes against the spiritual nature of progress and evolution. Yes. Well, I think that's the lesson because always this stuff is from my heart. When I had this open heart surgery six months ago, the the surgeon said the damage done inside of my heart, the scar tissue and what I look like inside, was well, she didn't figure how I got this far. Oh, wow. Well, but I understand the body. If you if you know it's not you, yeah. And you know it's yeah. just a machine. Yeah. You know, you need it's just a machine, okay. The thing you're gonna learn is the universe is fair and just and you never get away with anything. I will not discount divine intervention mm. because I'm still here. Yeah. Okay, and so I believe that it is not 100% me that gets me up from the dead. It's just I know how to cut really tight deals. <laughs> <laughs> a good negotiator. Yeah, you know, okay, you want me to go back to you? Okay, I like all that kind of talk. What's in it for me? Yeah. You know, and when you, when you learn the sense of interaction with the divine as a partner in co-creativity, when you learn that as a perspective, because... The meaning of life is to come here and practice being godlike. Mm, the whole joy to be a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being with dignity, direction, and purpose to reach this level of participation 
in practicing being godlike. And why I say that, if you think of everything that God is, compassionate, loving, caring, uh, enduring, love, um, preciousness, everything, safety, all of those things, and the giver of life. How often each day do you get a chance to practice being one of those things? Mm. How many times a day can you create someone to say thank you? Yeah. Okay. And you can create life. Yeah. That's everything that God is, or you think God is, or you hope God is, or you pray God is. That's everything. Yeah. So you're here practicing being a God. Well, how do I know that from, that's a philosophical perspective based yeah. on everything people think God is. But when you have a panoramic life of you, and everybody will have it, the Great Book of Judgment, the Hall of Records, all thing is written, blah, 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 blah. You're going to see your entire life pass before yeah. you in a 360-degree panoramic life of you. You will have missed nothing. Mm -hmm. You watch it from a second-person point of view as if you were your own best friend. Mm -hmm. Or you say, whoa, Dan, what in the world were you thinking? <laughs> and then, and then you, but it, this, it's the nature of us as spiritual beings. We're playfully spiritual beings. And then you look and say, oh, my God, way to go. You fool. Yeah. You did something great and didn't even realize that you didn't set it up that way. You change a person's life, you mm. know. And then you literally will become every person that you ever encounter. Mm -hmm. And you feel the direct results of your interaction between you and that person. Mm. So when you hear the words that we're all one, bet on it. Everything that you're doing to someone else, you're going to experience it. Because that's the nature of divine reality. Yeah. And at the end of it, it's just this question. And this is a Danianism. If God couldn't come today and God sent you, in the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? That's the meaning of life. Yeah. So based on my experiences, I decided that I would become a hospice volunteer. Mm -hmm. Because of what I understood about being a Marine and being what people all the religions, institutions, governmental natures of that deal with death, and what I knew, then the difference that me and God could make could be at the bedside of a veteran in transition, going from this world to the next with all the issues that veterans have, PTSD, traumatic yeah. brain injury, Agent Orange, Gulf War, Gulf War Syndrome, all the things that we did in war to kill us. Yeah. Okay, that that's what I could do. So when I said it was just being smart, from a Christian point of view, where the two of them are gather in my name, so shall I be mm. among you. Yeah. Okay, well, how can you set God up for that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, selling them wolf tickets. Yeah, yeah. I like it yeah. when God's talking. Okay, good. Where yeah. two of them are gather in my name, so shall I be among you? Okay, well, it's me, that person that's going, and coming to you. Yeah. Show and tell. <laughs> well, if you ever want to know and develop a personal relationship with the divine, whatever you want to name it, become a hospice volunteer or a caregiver. Because all of a sudden, on a daily basis, as a professional observation, you are the divine difference in that person's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be able to know that, that I am and have seen what they were looking up into in my eyes only makes me smart. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be over there forever. You just hear here 78 years. <laughs> Women 82.3 and a man 72.1. 72, 72 yeah. So 78 years. You're going to be over there forever. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you want to create a way that in service, as a value, you look for it equal to you as you look for everything else in a day. Once you do that, you create a spiritualistic capitalist perspective where in service, how can I make this place better than the way I found it? And how can I make an honest living at it, being truthful and in, in, in integrity with what I'm doing? Once that happens as a balance, there are so many levels of consciousness that come to serve you, you know, inspirations that come to serve you. So the wildest thing about the panoramic life review is that it now, is Now, do you have that panoramic life review every time? That's the bad part. It doesn't pick up where it left off. Okay. You have to say it doesn't matter when you have it. You're going to go back to the day you were born all the way to just before you let that last breath out. Mm. So I've had three and a half. And the third near-death experience, when I discovered the what I call the blue-gray place, that hellish place, because 
about 3% of all near-death experiences of the 75% that you can believe, there's a hellish place. Well, I always wondered about it because I never experienced it. Okay. I had two of them under my belt, okay, and I would never experienced it, and I didn't understand it. And But I know everything about the system because I'm obsessive compulsive. Hmm. You know, I'm going to understand it, look at it, and I understand the nature of how it operates up to 28 minutes. And then this last one, I was in surgery for six hours. Okay, wow. so I was the, I haven't found a language yet, but I was the whole universe. Mm. I became not this the first three times where it was a specific place. I was like the universe and I was observing dimensional realities that exist around us. Okay, dimensional realities that I was existing around us. But I got off the point. So if you become a hospice volunteer and where two or more gather in my name, so shall I be among you. This is some of the things I have seen. I've seen people lift out of their bodies. I've seen people come to get people, especially if they're afraid, to come to let them know it's okay. okay. And I have seen the room fill with light from a room sitting in the dark at 3 a.m. because people don't pass from this world 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. And if I'm working the shift and I happen to be there when they go, which has happened five or six times, I would say that 18 times in my 40 years, I have seen that happen. Wow. No question about it. So, I mean, if you want to really get a connection with the divine, become a hospice volunteer, yeah. and I'll guarantee you that level of dimensional reality that is our spiritual home will show itself to you. Mm. Okay, so the point is, per breath, watch this. You have a spiritual, you have a spiritual self. It exists in a realm of consciousness that's, got, that's exploring 55 billion things per second. It's quantumly calculating the birth of planets and, and uh, guppies in some lake on Mars, and it's worrying about what the, the rings of Saturn dissolve in, and it's in some other sub-dimensional reality, seeing what they're doing over there, you know, and it's exploring all kinds of things it's interested in, you know, like 67 billion miles an hour. To come over here, you have to become from a spiritual into an ethereal level of consciousness. It's like a, a communion place. And then you have to take on seven bodies. And each of these bodies are represented by a sinus cavity. And they're held together like a necklace with your breath. When you breathe in, you feel your sinus cavities up. It does moves oxygen, which is basically, moves air, which is basically nitrogen, into your system and 18% oxygen, some minerals and some dust, takes it into your system, and then you breathe out. Most people can't grip the fact that that breath that they breathe in and that breath that they breathe out change the universe. Yeah. That's the power in this dimension that you possess as a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being with dignity, direction, and pur purpose. And I don't care what you think. I don't care what kind of opinion you have about it. I will win this argument. Yeah. <laughs> and so what I try to do is say, look, everybody, we don't all need to go through it. Why would I be telling you? If you're going to be everybody that you've ever encountered, you're going to feel direct results of your interaction. Why in the world do you think I'd be lying to you? Mm -hmm. How important can you think you are? And I paid the price to gain this knowledge, and I spent 40 years dying with people. I know as much about the process spiritually, ethereally, emotionally, medically, and chemically, and physically as anybody. There's specialists that know more about me, but... I've been with 2,010 people. Mm. Yeah. You know, I've talked to them. I've seen all the issues that go on in the conversations between families and family members, and people are woefully unprepared. Catherine and I, my wife, we wrote a book called 10 Things to Know Before You Go. It's our next adventure before certainty. I write 10 Things to Know Before You Go, and then I have another book called Certainty. Birth brings certainty. If you understand these certainties, you're only going to empower your life and the lives of those around you. That's my last great book of the, yeah. of the Daniel series. But That's good because people are, that's kind of what all this is about is everybody is searching for certainty. Yeah.
well, I got it down pat. <laughs> I want to know I'm going to be okay when I die. And you're like, oh, yeah. Now let's Why? go to the next thing. <laughs> what? what do you, as long as you're breathing, yeah. you better, you, as long as you're breathing, you got a job to do. Yeah. So you better pay attention to that. Nobody dies and nobody goes to hell and all that stuff is nonsense. Good. It's just utter nonsense. It's got some kind of realm of possibility to it, but don't even buy that. My God, waiting 2,000 years for somebody to come back because he promised. Yeah. Some nails in his hand and stuff. <clears throat> I don't want somebody to die for me. I want somebody to live for yeah, me. Yeah, that's what it's about. There you, go. you, know, you should have stayed here. You know, I can keep coming back. Why come you got to wait 2,000 years? Yeah. What kind of nonsense yeah. is that? Give me a break. Well, I think that's the biggest thing (laughs) I've learned from some of the things you've been talking about, other things I've studied, is that this is where the action is. Right. Too many times we try to get out of here to get to there, whatever that religious context is. This is where the action is. We came here to be here. This is where you take great power and mighty and apply it in dignity, direction, and purpose. Yeah. There's only one thing that can ever go wrong with a spiritual being is you allow something to affect your dignity. It's usually a religion, a government, or an institution. Oh, man. And when your dignity... It skews your purpose, and then it affects your direction. Mm-hmm. And where we are, Mexico, yeah. we are so-called religion, so-called religious, or so-called spiritual, or religion, and they dictate Islam, Catholicism, Protestants, um, Hindu, uh, all those Zoroaster, all those religious Santeria, Voodoo, <laughs> all those religions constitute an ability to inhibit your expression of your true nature. Yeah. yeah. You know, you can feed every person on the earth. Well, why are we not doing it? Oh, my because God. Because somebody needs $17 billion to buy a $600,000 set of golf clubs. Yeah. Me, personally, I don't play golf because it probably costs 10000 a month with all the clubs I'd be throwing <laughs> in the lake. But I, 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 I care more about feeding veterans and yeah. uh, women's shelters. And, I mean, I spent my money on that. Yeah. I mean, I care more about it. So Kat and I wrote 10 things to know before you go. And the first page, it says, what's the number one cause of death in America and most other countries? And it has a big question mark. Turn to the next page. It says, no matter what you thought, birth, birth. is the number one oh cause of death. Oh, my God. That's so yeah. good. Birth is the number one cause of death. You turn to, and it's got a big exclamation point. You turn to the next page. It says, remember, if you're breathing, you're leaving. And if you just took a breath, this book is for you. Oh, so good. And I'll write 10 things, we, because when you send it into life care, you realize that couples have lost the ability to talk. And when one of them is losing their parent, the inability to have conversations at the time when you love someone who most needs you mm. is not there. Oh, boy. Um, and so I told Kat, and uh, I said, look, I mean, I do this all the time. I mean, I have tens of thousands of hours at the bedside and I'm on the phone because I get it really fast and I can help you find structure closure and help you deal with bereavement and block grief as a process because grief is the killer. Mm. It's okay to loss and it's okay to bereave because the nature of the seven bodies or systems is acclimated toward that. Mm-hmm. But what you do is you celebrate life. You know, they, they did good. Thank you very much. And mm-hmm. how you, how you structure closure and, and and limit grief by giving bereavement of a place, you know, as a value. And it's a conversation. So I'm like a clinical spiritualist. Mm. There's no woo-woo about me. <laughs> you know, I don't have any of that. You know? uh, Southern boy, left lane, hammer down, loves to race, yes, red yeah. line. Yeah, come on, let's make this happen. Yeah. So I don't have any of that. She has that, and I say fluff, but... She has that loving kind of poetic beauty mm. to uh, my nature, you know? And so I wanted people to have conversation. I want you to stop everybody and read this book and realize you're going to need this, this, this primer and you're going to need this. And the 10 things, one of, you know, my great appreciate, admire, and inspire. Mm. These are the three natures of a spiritual being. And if you understand why you're doing it and how you structure doing it, then you see more clearly what your goals are. Mm. There's no question that you know why you came here and there's no question that you know why you were sent here. It's not a big mystery. It's just being able to act accordingly, breathe sufficiently, stretch uh, reasonably and nutritionalize and hydrate 
purposely allows the seven bodies to give you back access to the divine level of consciousness. Mm. Okay? I can move through those levels of consciousness. I've been around them so long. I, 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 was, I was writing in certainty. I said, I said, I've been with people before, during, and a few after oh. this death process. I happen to have more friends that are dead than I have probably friends that are alive mm. because the dead ones know me better. Yeah. So when you think like that, then uh, things get clearer. Mm. So all that other stuff, and I look at, um, I was looking at, no offense to the Greek Orthodox, I was looking at the Orthodox priests in those dresses and them little hats. <laughs> I mean, what in the deal is that? <laughs> right. I bet that feels really good to have that special garb on. But what is the deal? And everything's got some big meaning. You know, yeah. the scarf is a certain color and a certain length. Yeah. Hey, what are you thinking? Yeah. What are you yeah. thinking about? If I could sell that garment, how many children six blocks from you could I feed? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my mindset. Yeah. Okay, and... If the Catholic Church has thirty-seven billion dollars, how many hungry children are within are within a ten-mile circle of the Vatican? Yeah, that's what I want to know. And if there's none, then y'all could dress up in them little outfits and stuff, you know, and put on them little dunce caps, and, you know, do all <laughs> that little stuff you want to do. But if there's a hungry child, yeah. You better be in the Batmobile or the Pope Mobile. Yep. Yeah. You better have you some meals on wheels, and you better be stopping and knocking on mm -hmm. doors because then you're important to me. Other than that's all bullshit. Yep. Excuse my Dutch, but I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Now, I like the piece that you taught that touched me is to leave things better than what they were before. Yeah. Well, that's the. Uh, you know? It's like going to a concert and picking up your trash when you leave. Yeah. yeah. You know, pick up your trash when you leave. Try to make it a better place than when you found it. Yeah. yeah. What I try to do is to to look at my, my audience in a presentation, and I am loving them. If people see me in an audience, I look at every single person in that room, and I'm going row by row, and I'm focusing on each person. And I'm looking at them as they're the only person in that room. And if you watch me, I do that through the whole presentation. Hmm. Because I really know how it works. Mm -hmm. I know I can send you love, and I know how you do it, and I can harmonize a certain sound in my voice. You can hear that that place in my voice, and how you know I'm telling you the truth. What people react to me is I'm telling you the truth. It might be a little disjointed because I get off on a tangent, but nonetheless, <laughs> what I'm telling you is the truth about who you are. Okay, and if you look at it from my point of view, you will see a complete another you, and you pay attention to your breath. I have these fixations about trace minerals. If anybody who's watching this or listening to this, please listen to me. Go to a health food store and get trace minerals. I like liquid trace minerals. Okay. Because if you want to be a psychic, you want to learn to read minds, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 12, the gifts of the Spirit, you need to take your trace minerals. Mm. You need to have your magnesium, you need to have potassium in your system. You need enough zinc to neutralize your thyroid because your thyroid and your pituitary are your, chem are your trace mineral regulators. So you need the perfect combination so that you can enhance the vibration to be able to access that level of perception. Interesting. Okay, mm. because... Uh, trace minerals make it all. Nutrition, y'all, everybody has to have it, but I don't tell people about that. Compound solution and enzyme reactions occur with trace minerals. So if you're not taking your trace minerals, I don't care what you believe, what you're hoping for, who your cousin's name is, who Jesus was that some guy was talking to, or God came to him. I saw a guy who said, you know, I had a conversation with God. And this is what he told me. Yeah, okay. You need to think about having a conversation with God. You blow up. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Blow up. I got as close to a conversation with God in this six hour open heart surgery. No, watch that. I could comprehend the universe. I could see its unfolding beauty and the, the divineness of it. 
And yeah, there's bumps like they were talked about extraterrestrials and reptilians. And that's the big thing today, you know, conversations because they've been lying to us and now people are seeing this. Mm. Well, I've run across in the course of my near death experiences and something I've never said before. The, the species, which I never knew they had a name until about 10 to 12 years ago, was an insectoid. Hmm. And they look like praying mantis, but they don't look like praying mantis, but they do look like praying mantis. Mm. You, don't, you can't describe it. The first time I saw them, they were plain, and it was like a level of consciousness that I passed through that they existed in another dimensional reality. In the Genesis, it says there are seven heavens, so those heavens must be seven different dimensions of heaven. If, if the Bible says, and you're looking at it from that biblical point of view, yeah. okay, the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 12, the gifts that you get if you believe in that spiritual focus. I think I'm pretty good at, there's nine of them, I'm pretty good at five. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm pretty good at five of them. Huh. And so I'm fair at one, and I got no range on the other two. But, I mean, the other three, but when you see these dimensional realities in this last open heart surgery, I passed through their level again, their level of consciousness again, but it had color to it. It had a shimmer into it and they were clothed. It was like they were attired, you know, instead of clothed, they were attired. I'm watching this because I have seen so much in 44 years of dying and looking at that dimensional reality as just another facet that we function in, like in the, if you look at the string theory and then you look at the chaos theory within the string theory, you find what's called the multi universe theory as a possible that you are occupying between 11 and 17 simultaneous realities. Well, when I first heard that, I, I, then I understood why I was so tired when I woke up in the morning. Because if I was having half as much fun in those levels of consciousness as I was having in this one, no wonder I was tired. Mm. But the point about these insectoids was... <laughs> that was, that was awesome. You got you to gotta wait. We're, our brains are catching up yeah, on that one. That just awesome. a <laughs> Spiritual beings are playful. Oh, yeah. They're loving and eternal. Uh-huh. We take on these realities because it's necessary to appreciate, be appreciated, to admire or be admired or to inspire or be inspired. Mm. You know, you aspire or you be inspired. There is no other motivation that a spiritual being has, no matter where it is. No matter where it is, mm. there's no other, there's no driver. Because all that other stuff that we're all supposed to be afraid of and supposed to be weird and odd and scary. So what? Mm. What are you going to do? Kill me? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Get you some. Yeah. You know, it's that coming back is the problem, but <laughs> we are living in a world that's shifting so fast and changing so fast. And when people say that, and it's not... It's not time that's speeding up. It's creation that's speeding up. Oh. The ability to create, look at games and look at virtual reality and look at, look at books that are yeah. written. I'll tell you someone, uh, Riz wrote a simulation. He wrote a book about this. He's an MIT professor. And he wrote about simulation reality. And he, he believes that we are functioning in the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I believe that not quite that, no. but something close to that. No. And when you want to get real religious, I don't believe anybody ever leaves heaven. Mm. I don't think that you're even here. Mm -hmm. This is my personal belief. This is a matrix type simulation. It's not real. Why? No. Watch. Everybody thinks I'm tapping this table. But if you had an electron microscope no. and you had it right along this beam, you would realize that that's electron disbursement. I never touch this table. No. You never touch anything in your entire no. life, ever. Mm. Okay? So if you never touch anything in your entire life, ever, while you're here, how can you tell me or prove to me that you're here? And that's a scientific fact. Yeah. That's a scientific fact. Yeah. So if you're not touching anything... And you can measure that you're not touching anything. 
then how can you tell me you're here? Yeah. First, we were blood, bones, and meat. Mm -hmm. Then in 1929, we invented penicillin because we got some molded bread. Yeah. Then we became chemical beings. Mm. And God became a chemist and a doctor. Ah. Now we're quantum. We're electrical beings. So where science and spirituality meet is in the quantum dynamic level of unity and union. Mm. Not only that, we have proven and replicated something called the Higgs boson particle, yeah. the so-called God particle, that says that the entire universe floats in a matter they call dark matter. Mm -hmm. So now God has a name. She's called dark matter. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we not only have scientific proof that we're all connected as one, yeah. we have replicated scientific proof that we're all, we're all connected, connected as, as one. one. We have scientific proof. And we all supposed to be waiting on some guy to come back uh, from heaven uh, and bring a whole bunch of warring angels yeah. to kill all the evil people that we help perpetuate, create, support, and allow to manifest. Yeah. Yeah. So if Jesus did such a good job when he died for our sins, how come he's got to come back again? <laughs> right? <laughs> so fun. Those tribalism, those earth mythologies that people still hold on to, yeah. whatever that is. Or, or yeah. a combination thereof. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. now that you know that, now that you know that all your relatives are filled with my map from out and lying in some box, mm -hmm. it's a good reason to go up to the graveyard and take them some flowers because they're not going anywhere yeah. till Jesus comes back and throws the <laughs> devil in the lake of fire. Oh, my. Do you know how crazy that is to somebody who's had a near-death experience? Yeah. And he's going to come back. I hope when Jesus gets here, other than being in the catering business, I have, I, I'm a couple of payments ahead on a backhoe. <laughs> oh, so I can dig all those bodies up so he can take the top off and raise everybody. Can you imagine the taking that formaldehyde foot filled body all wrinkled up mm -hmm. to heaven and to be a spiritual being in that body? How crazy can you be? Yeah. Is that part yeah. of just magical thinking? Thinking that it's magical. And I don't mm -hmm. know, I can't explain it. It's just magic. No, it's, it's a part of being stupid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that. Yeah, it's a part of being stupid. Who in the world would want to take that thing to heaven? Yeah. And who in the world would want to re-energize that thing? From dust to dust and dust it shall return. Yeah. So if you read the Bible and you watch it, modern day social structures of what we do, they don't match. So not only is it not true, it doesn't match the teachings. Hmm. So it's some delusional concept that you've created to make you feel like you're not responsible for what you do. Yeah. Well, guess yeah. what? The panoramic life review that everybody describes at a certain depth and nature within the near death experience is says that that's not true. Yeah, that's really you know. Nice. And so, somebody asked me the other day. He said, "Well, Daniel, why do you think there's so much information about this?" I said, "Well, I said I was thinking about God, and I always refer to God in the feminine." I love that. Yeah. Well, but because you can't threaten me. You can't intimidate me. You can't do anything to make me change from who I think I am and what I believe. You can't do it. I know pain. I know what's next. I got it down pat, and I've helped a lot of people go from this world to the next that are friends of mine on that side, helping people make sure they don't get trapped in that blue-gray place, that place I wrote about in uh, Secrets. Because there is a place based on free will that you do not have to go down the tunnel. You have free will. That was the deal. You don't have to leave until you get ready. Mm. So if you're an alcoholic or a narcissistic sociopath or a drug addict, you're going to feel the connection between that level and this level, and you want to keep perpetuating that, and religion keeps perpetuating it. Yeah. Uh, Institutions keep yes. perpetuating it. Government keeps perpetuating it because as long as you don't think you're a spiritual being and that you're worthy because you were guilty of what some Arabs was doing in the desert 6,000 years ago, long as you can hold on that to a mindset, you're not going to progress to a certain point. So the, so you lose control of your life based on being afraid of dying and going to heaven. Mm -hmm. How in the world can you be afraid of doing something that never happens? And how in the world can you be afraid of going someplace to where you're going to be with all your relatives and all your friends, and you hope that based on you being you, 
you got to be saved by somebody. And if you don't get saved, then you're going to hell. Yeah. That is not true. Yes. So when you get down to it, whether it's by deeds or by grace, I think it's a happy combination of both. But not even that works. Nobody's going to die. Nobody's going to go to hell. So I tried to figure out where hell was. So hell's in the Bible like eight times. And most of the time they're talking about the the trash dump outside of Gethsemane. Yeah. Yeah. So we give you an idea of the lake of fire yeah. because you have yeah. you have methane gas yes. and it keeps burning. That's where that concept of throwing in the lake of fire. And what they did in, in Jerusalem was they burned all the prisoners. They burned all the thieves. They burned all the criminals. Because in that particular part of the world, if the body was destroyed, not put in the ground, and it was cremated like the stories are telling now, then you don't go to heaven. Uh-huh. And that's eternal damnation. And you put all the trash and everything in it. We have garbage dumps burning in Chicago because of methane. Yeah. So there's where the lake of yeah. fire came from in that trash dump. And very rarely does it talk about anything other than that. So when you look at the Bedouins or the the Sadek, Sadek Hebrews, which are the Canaanite Hebrews that are nomadic to that particular tribe before the Russian Jews migrated into Israel, Palestine, Sumeria, Canaanite, and Judea. If you look at it, they were nomadic. Mm. So how the nomadic tribes, since everybody had that sanitation pit, didn't eat pork, you didn't eat certain things, Mm. and you put everything in that pit, then how they would migrate from Bedouins, which are Berber, migrate, they would tell the children that, okay, if you don't straighten up when we get to the next campsite, I'm going to throw you in the lake of fire because how they would start a fire is they would dig up the old trash pit. It's on fire because the methane is burning from decomposition, and that's how they would light their fires when they got there. Wow. So the, the, the old wives' tale of threatening children, because I went there. You know, I could buy an airplane ticket. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And so I said, okay, let me see what that is. Let me go listen to hear that story. So you ask enough people and you look at enough scripture and you listen to the stories of the Bedouin tribes and you you realize that that's where the story came from. And now it's evolved into something you think is real. Mm-hmm. How could Moses have written the first five books of the Bible? Right. Yeah. Who is crazy enough to think that? Yeah. And John, I read the Revelation of John the other day. Now, my record not, my, my recommendation to John was, he was doing just a little too much of whatever he was doing. It wasn't doing quite enough. <laughs> because by the time I got to seeing that ten-headed dragon come out of the ocean and all that stuff, I know I better eat one more or I better <laughs> I better go I better go to intensive care and get me some Thorazine. <laughs> Think about how crazy that oh, sounds. Oh, it's so good. That's so crazy. Well, you give presence to the divine as the feminine. You even talk about that sensuality. Mm -hmm. Rather than that masculine that wants to go be war, and I'm mad at you, and vengeance is mine. How can that be love? You give presence to that love, that softness. Because it's the way it is. When you get over there, it's sensual. Mm. I mean, it's sensual. There's There's no way. And I try to explain it from here is... All of us want to be needed and cared for and cared about. And in return, we will care about that person because that's how relationships are. But when you get over there, the greatest moment is that you know you are recognized. You feel and know you are connected. It never goes away. Once you get down the tunnel, you're a part of it and it's a part of you. It's a mutual admiration society that intertwines equally. The, the field of flow of the essence through you is one of the things you blocked. So based on what you were chosen to do and what you choose to do, you block that connection out. Yeah. But once you finish with your job and you got your little mess done and you figured out how much trouble you could create and then you figured out how to get out of it, yeah. I keep thinking I can get up from the dead and damn if I can't keep doing it. Oh, boy. I'm getting kind of tired of it, though, but, <laughs> but it's, been a fun, it's been a fun experiment. Yeah. So once you realize that and you put that into motion in your life, you pay attention to your breathing and take trace minerals every day. You take trace minerals before 10 a.m. Mm. Why? Because the body hunts sugar at 10, 2, 4, and 7. And if you put the trace minerals in and the body's hunting sugar, and I use apple juice 
because apple juice is not acidic as orange juice and when the body's hunting sugar the trace minerals in the apple juice and the body will break down and move those trace minerals faster into the places that I need so that I can sustain my physical self and repair a body that just got it from the dead six months ago. Yeah. Wow. That's at 15% heart function. Mm. Wow. 12% you done. So you're just dropping knowledge. You know, this is a free show for people, right? <laughs> just <laughs> dropping knowledge. Thank you for the contribution That's for tough. even health. Do you know what? Why not? Uh, look, like I said earlier in the presentation, hey, everybody. Yeah. The earth operates at 7.83 hertz. That's her rhythm. Yeah. Mother Nature. And if you don't put your feet yeah. in the grass every so often and breathe in and breathe out, then you lose that frequency. The worst thing that ever happened to us was electricity because we lost the rhythm of the universe. But today, yeah. it's in the hundreds. It's in the hundred hertz. It is fluctuating at a speed, and for you to understand electricity, between 7.8 hertz and 113 hertz, that kind of scale is un unbelievable. And true magnetic north, which is how your cell phone works, your GPS system works, your, your gas stations operate, all satellites, all military, they've had to recalculate it and recalibrate it. Why? True Magnetic North used to be 12 miles south of the North Pole, 12 miles east. It's now in Siberia. Oh, my. So you are watching a fluctuation of the Earth, unprecedented, and the last time it polarity shift, I think, was 183,000 years ago. Oh, wow. But it's unprecedented. And you can just look this up on the Internet. This isn't some voodoo. And what's happening? Okay, everybody, and if they have to recalculate and remeasure it, what is happening? Well, I think a new age is being born. Mm, yes. Wow. All of us know that if you were born in America before 2008, that America disappeared in 2008. Mm. But the country you were born in doesn't exist anymore, and you're watching a new country come into existence. Yeah. Mm. Why? Because the shift is on. Mm. We've moved into a new age. And in that new age, we have to reformulate. We, the universe and this planet is reacting. And it's reacting to all the things that we are doing or all the things that we're not doing. Mm. So I believe people need to pay attention to the breathing, need to take the trace minerals, yeah. and they need to get past a bunch of old stories that never were true to start right. with. Yeah. If you go back to three, 340, if you go back to 325 at the Edict of Nicaea, they didn't know who Jesus was. Yeah. It was just making him up then. Yeah. Was he God? Was he God incarnate? Nobody thought it was a son or anything. Was he a prophet? Okay, like uh, Islam thinks Jesus was a great prophet, uh, not great as Muhammad, but pretty good. Okay, you <laughs> yeah. know, at the Omaye Temple in downtown Damascus, they have a they have a tower to Jesus as a prophet. Mm. Uh, the body of John the Baptist, other than his head, is in the Omaye Mosque in downtown Damascus. In a, in a mosque. Mm -hmm. And if you go there, they got all these little sticks of paper. People like the Wailing Wall. They, the Islam goes and worships uh, John. Because mm. they don't know what happened to his head. Yeah. But, <laughs> but they worship John and they just like the Wailing Wall. That soul mentality, that whole psychology is yeah. in play. So then at uh, Edict of Milan around 348, they decided that he was the son of God. Mm -hmm. But it took them 200 years to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Deified him. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure that they, they did that yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they deified him. Mm. Okay. Because how can you deify something that breaks its bond based on it destroyed its, it let itself be destroyed for something you did? Yeah. When the panoramic life review proves unequivocally that that is not true. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to tell you my last joke to close about feminine. So somebody asked me, and they said, Daniel, why do you think that so many people are coming back now? I said, well, here's what I think. God, she was hanging out in heaven. And she was looking around, and she realizes that the only difference between God and the doctors, she never thinks she's a doctor. <laughs> so good. Okay. So she said, 
So it's chemistry. So what I'll do is give them a little advanced cardiopulmonary resuscitation and a little better understanding of how you balance enzyme reactions and chemistry in the body using nanoparticulation. And I'll send a bunch of them back. So who do you blame for people who have near-death experiences? You blame the same system that says you live in a dead universe and all you are is a bunch of chemical reactions and there's nothing after this. Then we come back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're back. So the same people who said she doesn't exist are now proving and verifying that she does because we've been there and because of their advancements in chemical and science, they can bring us back. So now all of a sudden, everybody who thought they were gods trying to figure out how to explain us away and there's so many of them because of their advancements in technique that there's nothing they can do. Mm. So all of a sudden, she's back in the, she's back front and center. Yep, yep. That nice. was beautiful. At the end of the episode, what we like to do is we like to give the guests the opportunity to say, if there's one thing you take away from my work and there's one thing I want you to make sure you know, it's this thing. So You will never die and you're not going to hell. Get over it yeah. and start being the best you can be and look around at what we've done wrong and pick up your trash. Pick up your trash. Look at plastic. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Petrochemical plastic takes 10,000 years. Hemp plastic takes 120 days. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Right. You have an endocrine system that hunts CBDs. CBDs, cannab cannabidiodes. You have a whole endocrine system. Does medicine ever talk about it? No. Is it a part of the immune system? Does it have a vascular system that's as big and as wide as your immune system or as your lymphatic system or as your vascular system? Yes, it does. Why are you not utilizing it based mm -hmm. on some bull that science is telling you about a weed? Call him. Yeah. And that I love you very, very much. Awesome. Awesome. Right. Daniel Brinkley, thank you. Thank Namaste. You. Pleasure. Thanks for joining us here on Exploring the Human Journey. You can find us as a video on YouTube or listen to us as a podcast. You can also join in the conversation by following us on Facebook and Instagram. For more information, go to the website at exploringthehumanjourney.com.